Well, for many years, I can think of one or two quite remarkable stories I've come across, but the one I'd like to share with you now is perhaps the most remarkable of the lot. It's the tale of how the world's fastest amphibious vehicle was developed. It's a quite remarkable story about a man called David Royal, the team he worked with, and how they, over many years, developed a dream. It's a vehicle which it's very hard to believe until you see it, but a vehicle which might make quite a big difference to the future of our planet. It's a story well worth telling. David, before we get up to this world-beating invention of yours, it's almost as though fate led you that way because your whole family history was surrounded by vehicles and inventions, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was indeed. My father was interested in motor transport of all sorts. Unfortunately, he died when I was a boy, but he left a lot of old film, which I have, and there's boats and cars and even a penny farthing on one of them. And, and yeah, I, I just followed in his footsteps, really. I have the impression, David, that life for you as a youngster was invention, new things, development all around you, as though this was simply a part of normal life. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, my father and my mother were always doing things, making things. My father took his first patent out when he was 25. And whatever he became involved with, he always wanted to try and improve it and better it. And he, he, uh, he handed down to me the gift to be able to use my hands and, and work with my mind. And to be creative is, it was a great, always a great pleasure. And uh, I just, I think I've just followed in their footsteps, really. You mentioned penny farthings, and I, and I suppose lots of the youngsters now riding a very modern road bike would look at that and, and smile a bit. But somebody had to get that idea first. And even if people fell off them, they were quite something at the time, weren't they? Well, they were. I mean, the penny farthings are known as an ordinary bicycle, and they were extremely unsafe. You, you could, if you went over the handlebars, you just had nowhere to go except on your face. I think the penny farthing is, um, yeah, it's a very period piece of engineering and it's been improved enormously since then. Uh, but yeah, we, we, my father had cars and boats and all the things that I love as well. But he didn't just simply drive them, he, he loved to create and work on them and create new ideas with them. And he took patterns out and, and various ideas. It was generally a very creative atmosphere. What really fascinated me looking at some of this old film was that early caravan, because I suppose many drivers in an English summer are used to seeing literally thousands of them up and down the roads. But somebody had to start somewhere. And looking at pictures of that caravan, that was something of a groundbreaker at the time, wasn't it? it, it yeah, it seems strange, really, because, um, as you say, today there's thousands of them. But in those days, I think, A, they were fairly costly, I uh, think, to have. Uh, but I think my father also liked doing things that were new and new ideas and the caravans were really only just starting to, to find their wheels or their feet in those mm. days. And uh, it obviously was, gave him the freedom he wanted, which is what I like. I like the freedom to be able to do whatever I choose to do and that's a great luxury in this life. When you talk about the modern world, the word change is always in there. And in transport it usually is as well, except for amphibious vehicles. Just come through the list with me and I'll show you what I mean. The penny farthing, of course, has changed beyond all recognition. The modern bike is lighter, faster, gears, brakes. And look at air transport. The biplane has evolved into the modern long-distance airbus we know today. And cars, of course. Can you imagine going into a car showroom and finding somebody trying to sell you a vehicle like the old days, complete with man walking in front with red flag? Of course not. Things have moved on substantially in 60 years. So that's true for all kinds of transport except the amphibious vehicle. What's still around was exactly that, a vehicle from 60 years ago, until David Royal made it different. When you get a, a technology which hasn't developed for 60 years, there's so much room for, for development that it's wonderful and, and very exciting to be able to do it. And the, the ducks were very successful, but they were something that were literally knocked up in six weeks during the war by the Americans, and they performed very well during the war. But they're very simple in the way they're put together, and they're basically a converted truck. Whereas I, I completely pushed that aside, started with a whole clean sheet of paper, and decided how I would proceed, forgetting all historical developments, because it's so primitive compared to modern technology, that it was no good developing from it. I had to start completely afresh. Is this one of the problems when you're talking to people who don't have your breadth of knowledge? I suppose to some people you say amphibious vehicle and people say, oh yes, I've seen one of those. It's a duck, isn't it? That's exactly it. And because most of the money is in the south, they, they, they won't bother to come and see what we've done up here. And they, it really is, although I say myself, it's a completely new technology. 
and, and has many advanced features like retractable wheels and special steering mechanisms and, and the whole design of the structure of the vehicle itself is a monocoque and you don't get monocoque buses in the case of our bus model. Uh, but no, we are way ahead of everybody and unfortunately people you speak to don't understand amphibians, they've never been in one. If there'd been a new mobile telephone or something similar that everybody's familiar with, there probably would have been no problem. But talk to people about an amphibian and the first thing they think of is a wartime duck. And, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately it's so deeply rooted in their minds they can't get rid of it. And they just think of some boxy, un unattractive, primitive piece of kit that really is a war vehicle. So tell me about the R&D then. In order to develop amphibians, you've got to really put some time and effort into it. And we've been doing research and development work for between 15 and 20 years. Huge amount of work because we're starting from scratch. Just talk me through, David, the, the way you develop a vehicle like this. Because when you start off with version 1 and then you lead up to the more advanced ones that we can see, there's quite a process there, isn't there? Developing prototypes is a very long and complicated business if you do it properly. And we wanted to do it properly. And so we start off by building one that would, would perform at high speed, which is the whole target we were aiming for. So we built the first one, the Mark I, and we were thrilled a bit because it did the 30 knots we were aiming for. Then we went on to test water jets and different principles of suspension. That was Mark II. Then the Mark III went bigger still towards more commercial type of vehicle. And again, testing new different ideas for suspension and different ideas for steering. And they were extremely successful. So when we got to the Mark IV, uh, it was absolutely uh, spot on and worked beautifully. We're thrilled to bits with it. But it is a very long and painful process at times and you learn as much from your mistakes, of course, as you do from the actual successes. In terms of human progress, you often have to stand back to realise how far we've come. And sometimes there's quite a smile along the way. You've probably heard the wonderful quotation soon after the invention of the telephone somebody thought that one day every American city would have one of these wonderful gadgets. Look at where we are now, we take it for granted, we can pick up a mobile phone the size of a credit card and talk to a friend just about anywhere in the world. So quite often it's a case of seeing progress and lateral thinking and long experience and in the case of David Royal he has that in a very big way. I was in a tremendously advantageous position because of all the vehicles I've worked on over the last 40 years. Uh, we've, we've worked on cars from, an, from the turn of the 19th century, from the 1890s, the very, very earliest motor cars, right the way through to those of, of the pre-war period, the veteran, the vintage, classic sports racing cars. And I worked at the bench myself for 30 years, so I was actually handling and dealing with all the different mechanisms that have been invented over the last hundred years in, mo in automotive transport. So I had an extremely privileged insight into what went into a motor vehicle. And then, having at the same time built boats and been involved with boats all my life, I was able to combine the two technologies from the outset. If you get two people like a marine engineer and an automotive engineer and put them on opposite sides of the table, each will fight their corner. I didn't have to do that. I sat in the middle of the table and agreed with myself. And so I was able to apply the two technologies together. So it saved a huge amount of time and I was able to go into great detail on both sides, double checking that everything was suitable for amphibians on the road and suitable for amphibians on the water. And of course it made, a, it made for the success that we've seen. I had about 12 different criteria for every single component. So before I, when I was designing the components to make these machines, Every single one was considered whether it would be suitable for salt water, uh, immersion in salt water, whether it would be reliable, whether it would be simple to operate, how well it would work on land, how well it would work on the water. And all these things I was able to do together, which gave me a tremendous advantage. And this was where one person has got the advantage over a committee, because you, 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 you can see all the problems together and apply them at once, which gave me a huge advantage. Now here's a real challenge for you. Can you explain to me as a non-engineer what is the, the key point about what you've done here? Because when you look at this business of retractable wheels, the differential and the rest of it, without giving too many secrets away, well, what makes yours different to what's been done before? It's the whole structure, the whole structure and the design. For instance, I don't have a chassis like uh, any normal bus or, or lorry would have. Uh, the, the, the whole vehicle is built of marine quality aluminium, so it won't corrode in salt water. The suspension is built of stainless steel, so it also is, anti, is against uh, electrochemical reactions. Uh, the wheels retract, as you've already mentioned. There were some serious problems that had never been overcome uh, with steering, because if you take a wheel that's going to be retracted by as much as a metre, 
and you've got to steer it, brake it, uh, when I say brake it, I mean make it <laughs> brake on the road, uh, you, you, and make the suspension retract. You've got challenges there that have never been met yet, and that, that was one of the great interesting challenges I had, and it, it took me many, many hours to, to, to sort this out. And I've spoken to a lot of engineers since, and in fact, this is one of the main patents on the designs because it was a, it, it was one a main major problem with retracting wheels on a vehicle because you haven't got like an aircraft which has retractable wheels. You don't have large fuselages or wings where you can park the wheels when they're being retracted. In this case, the wheels are coming up into the vehicle where people are sitting. So you've got to they've got to be very compact and got to be very neatly designed as well of course as being legally operable on the road. It was doing it all at once and having the knowledge that I'd gained over the last 40, 50 years that was so valuable. What really strikes me when you look at your vehicles and they're actually going from land into water or vice versa, they genuinely look at home in both environments, don't they? It doesn't look as though they're awkward on land or difficult in water. You just see them going down a slipway, coming back up. They look as though they live there. They, do, they don't look as though they're odd. Well, that's nice of you to say that, and that's, that's what I was aiming for. And to do that, there is a great deal of innovation in the whole overall design. Uh, when you, for instance, if you launch any vehicle down a ramp into water, as the, as the front of the vehicle enters the water, uh, the weight matters hugely there because if it's too heavy, it will, it will almost be like a submarine. It will carry on going under the water. So weight has, is a huge consideration. And as in when you're designing a boat, the trim of the vessel is very important. So that the, the weight disposition for on the road and on the water had to be all taken into account at the same time. Let's talk about some of the applications for this vehicle. One of the first things that strikes me, and I think anybody living in England will remember Newsreel from not too long ago when cities like York and towns like Doncaster were badly flooded. But what struck me is that you've got a situation where in the 21st century how you rescue people is just plain primitive. You know, you have people going in with tractors and trailers or trying to struggle through the water, people being carried out in dinghies and rowing boats are on firefighters' shoulders and all the rest of it, a vehicle like yours could actually revolutionise what happens when natural disaster strikes. That's one of the main reasons I started to design it. There, there is a clear need for these and we could empty streets in no time at all with our buses and our amphibious flood rescue machines. And it, it, they are ideal for, for, for flooded regions. For instance, we don't have the propellers that stick down. Uh, because if you've got that and you're going over a wall or something, it'll just knock the propeller off. So we have water jet propulsion, which means you can slide over objects that are underwater and you can't even see. So that there's, there's a huge amount of thought gone into this. And they would be absolutely ideal for flood. And this is why I find it uh, so rewarding, is that we produce something that so many people can see will be useful. And I mean inundated from all over the world with requests for vehicles for precisely that purpose. And you can see a worldwide need, can't you? Because whatever people believe about climate change or global warming or the rest, there's no doubt we are getting more severe weather patterns going on. And you can imagine if you've been hit by that and people's lives are threatened, seeing one of your vehicles come to rescue instead of rowing boat or a dinghy would be a blessed relief. Absolutely, and they're very, very stable. This was also a main feature I built into them, is the design of the hull and so forth is such that you're very, you've got a very stable platform to work on. So for even for fires or for whatever you're using them for, they're, they're all-round useful emergency services vehicle. As well as the kind of rescue application for this vehicle, David, it must occur to many people, you look at so many congested cities where traffic doesn't move, and what do they have? Running through them is a huge river, and waterways in the United Kingdom are quite rampant, there are plenty of them, many parts of the world have water that could be used better. Your vehicle would really fit the bill there, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's one of the major uses of them, because we can drop in and out of water very easily. Use, for instance, a two-mile section of a canal or a river that's going through the middle of a city, which currently is absolutely empty and then come back out onto a quiet piece of road and use the road again. It's the flexibility which has the advantage. One thing that strikes me as well is that if you look at an area like the United Arab Emirates and probably the world home of lateral thinking at the moment, there are brilliant developments like Palm Island and so on. Again, you've got water and land being, if you like, melded together. Well, what a great application for yours where you can actually be going from literally desert to the sea to an island in one vehicle. Yeah, this is one of the great advantages, it is the fact that you can use it 
where you've got water and land mixed, as it were. And Palm Island was a, it was a, a, a very early thought when they started building that. I realised how ideal it would be for that. In fact, we've had quite a lot of inquiries from that part of the world. And uh, we're hoping that we might one day meet somebody who will, be, who, who will see the potential out there. Because I understand that the roadways are already fairly uh, clogged with traffic. And of course, these don't need to use busy roadways. I suppose too, the, the, the good thing about your vehicles is they, they can be called on for whatever need at the time. You, you may well have some vehicles in a part of the world which are being used for commuter transport or tourist purposes, but if disaster strikes they can immediately be in action for rescue as well, can they? That's absolutely right. One of the great problems is that, that normally if you have specialist vehicles, they are for just one purpose. For instance, you may think that uh, flood rescue vehicles are just for flood rescue, but in fact they can be, they can be have a roof put on them, maybe used as a minibus, or they can be used to carry goods. One of the common misconceptions is that you're going to produce an amphibian that will satisfy all the needs. This is far from the truth. Uh, if you're going to carry 16 tons of bricks, you don't buy a sports car. And if you're going to transport 12 people, uh, you don't buy a 35-seater bus. So there's, like all normal road transport, you've got to have a range of possibly 10 or 12 different types of vehicles to meet different needs. And they will all be able to travel on motorways at cruising speeds of 60, 70 miles an hour and be able to travel in water at high cruising speeds if they're needed, up to 30, 40 knots, which is fast on water. And our vehicles are the very first ones in the world to be able to do that. So the, the, the uses are widespread, but people have got to understand that we're talking here about a completely new industry. It's not just a one gimmick vehicle. It is a range of vehicles. What it is, is a brand new technology which encompasses all manner of different metals, principles of design and construction, suspension, retractable, steering, all these different things have been put together so that you've got the framework in which you can design and build whatever sort of vehicle you want, but all will have the benefit of being dual purpose. So you can travel at speed on water and at speed on the road. I suppose as well to return where we started, the, the great thing is despite the fact that this is very much your baby, it's also a team effort and that you've actually used a lot of brains and colleagues and people around you there have been literally tens of thousands of hours developing in this. This is not just an idea, this is something which works. I'm glad you mentioned that because this has been a problem in the past. Because I'm the lead figure in this, people just think, oh, it's a one-man band who's doing his own little thing. Far from the truth, uh, we've worked with people at, uh, from various new universities, with various professors who've come along, they've seen this, they've examined it, they've worked with me on it, and ha have been wonderfully helpful. Also, very uh, major industries, people in Vickers who, who build the Challenger tanks have worked with their chief engineer who's been very helpful. Um, Rolls-Royce have been very helpful. Their ch chief scientist, Sir Alex Smith, was my chairman for 12 years. And this is another misconception which is quite serious because people look at me and think, well, this is just a one-man band. Far from it. We've had some of the top, the, the Europe's top marine designers, top uh, automotive designers, aerodynamics designers, di hydrodynamics designers, and they've worked with me and continue to do so, and they've been wonderfully supportive. And they know that we, we've, we've had to manage on a very minimal amount of money, and many of them have worked with me for nothing, because they can see that this has got huge potential, and they just want to help. So it, it has been a wonderfully positive process, the whole thing. It must be very satisfying to, to see the vehicles actually working. That, that lovely view of your vehicle at the Falkirk Wheel in Scotland, it's so, if you like, symptomatic of what this can be. The Falkirk Wheel was uh, an interesting answer to a problem, and your vehicle is an interesting answer to a worldwide need. It must be very satisfying to see it come to fruition. Yes, it was, it was, it was good to bring these two things together. Uh, as you say, the Falkirk Wheel is a very impressive piece of engineering and quite uh, remarkably on its, in its scale and some of the problems they had to overcome. Not in, in, on a bigger scale, similar problems to myself, where you're dealing with water, you've got to make watertight uh, gates and, and seals to, to prevent the canal. I mean, when the wheel turns on the Falkirk wheel, there's a whole canal uh, adjoining it, and that has to be sealed while the wheel turns. And these are the sort of things that, uh, that make for modern technologies that people have got over these problems and we had the same. So to see the two working together was a great treat. Let's finish David with a look at a future where with the right vision to match yours and the investment capacity to actually get this moving worldwide we're going to have billions of pounds of turnover, a real answer to the world's needs in rescue and tourism and transport. What would the young man David Royal who was starting out on this think of all that? 
the young David Royal would have been absolutely thrilled if he'd known what he would be doing <laughs> when he's more mature like we are now. I mean, it, was, it, it, it is a great thrill to, to have designed and built something like this. But as a young man, as a young boy, it would, it would have been almost unbelievable. I personally have put in around about 45,000 hours of work on this, mostly unpaid, <laughs> because all the money I had had to go into the project. We needed to raise as much money as we could, and it is a big project for a small team. But uh, the benefits are, to the world as a whole will, will be really, truly substantial. I know it sounds uh, quite a big step to make, but uh, the ongoing floods, as you, as you previously mentioned, which you see year in and year out, they, they will benefit hugely from this. Humanitarian aid all over the world will benefit from this, as well as public transport. I, I just feel that this is a huge opportunity for somebody, and they've got to know that this is an honest, straightforward project. It is, it is no big money maker. I haven't been making money at all. The whole thing is to try and create something useful, and the thrill of seeing it in, in everyday use around the world, rescuing people and so forth in, in that sense, and in public transport in this country relieving congestion on the roads, I think it'll be absolutely wonderful and it'll mean that all the work will be worthwhile. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of hours of work and diligent, honest work, not how quick can we make a fast buck. This is a slow buck and whoever comes in now is going to be part of something truly remarkable. They, they're going to see a whole new transport industry. I know it sounds grand, but it's absolutely true. This, this type of transport has been dormant for 60 years, 60 years. What other form of transport has stayed like that? None. The aircraft, motor cars, buses, ships, they've all advanced and advanced. This has stayed absolutely frozen still. And it's a great thrill to have the opportunity to create something so important and so global out of one small workshop.